Warm greetings from Washington, D.C., which sits on the ancestral lands of the Anacostians, Piscataway, and Pamunkey peoples. Saludo desde Washington, D.C., la capital de los Estados Unidos. My name is Michael Orlov, and I'm the Director of State, Regional, and Local Partnerships and International Activities for the National Endowment for the Arts, and I'm joined by my colleague, Guillermo Ochoa, International Specialist. On behalf of all of our colleagues at the National Endowment for the Arts, we are absolutely honored to be hosting the 2021 America's Cultural Summit, along with our dear friends at the International Federation of Arts Councils and Cultural Agencies. Of course, we wish we could be together in person and perhaps visiting the great monuments and other cultural sites here in Washington, D.C., but that will have to be for another time, hopefully in the not too distant future. Nos hubiera encantado tenerlos aquí en Washington, pero tendremos que esperar para otro momento. The National Endowment for the Arts is the country's federal arts agency and the largest public funder of the arts in the United States. As we know you do, we believe that the arts help strengthen economies, promote health and well-being, and unite our communities around the world. The National Endowment for the Arts takes great pride in supporting arts projects in the United States through grant making, special initiatives, partnerships, and events just like the one we are hosting this week. We look forward to listening, learning, and sharing with all of you, focusing on how to promote the arts across diverse populations and on critical issues of our time, such as sustainability, equity, and climate change. Y ahora abrimos la Cumbre Cultural. Wishing you all a fruitful and fulfilling America's Cultural Summit. Hasta See you pronto. soon. Hello, everybody. On behalf of the National Endowment for the Arts, it is my honor and privilege to welcome you to the 2021 America's Cultural Summit. I'm Rod Joy, and I'm proud to serve as a Chief of Staff at the National Endowment for the Arts. Established by Congress in 1965, the Arts Endowment is the independent federal agency that works to give people across America the opportunity to experience and participate in the arts. Art, in its many forms, is an essential asset here in the United States and across the globe in bringing diverse people and communities together. The National Endowment for the Arts is proud to partner with the International Federation of Arts Councils and Culture Agencies, IFACA, to host the 2021 America's Cultural Summit, a gathering of distinguished delegates from 14 nations across the Americas. We are meeting at a time of enormous consequence. We are still climbing our way out from the global COVID-19 pandemic. We are battling a climate crisis, what President Biden has called a red alert situation for our planet. And in communities all across the globe, we're seeing a long overdue reckoning and worldwide focus on systemic inequality and injustice. The theme of this year's summit is towards a more equitable, inclusive, and sustainable future. This theme resonates deeply with the mission of the Arts Endowment and with President Biden's goals for the United States in this pivotal moment. Throughout the summit, we will hear from renowned and inspiring artists who have the ability to fill our lives with joy and meaning, shift our perspective, and change how we consider and interact with the world. We will also have an opportunity to hear from and interact with leaders from our hemisphere who are driving change through the arts and cultural diplomacy. A special thank you to U.S. Interior Secretary Deb Holland and Assistant Secretary of State Brian Nichols for their meaningful and thoughtful participation in this summit. As the great poet Maya Angelou once said, we delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but rarely admit to the changes it has gone through to achieve that beauty. By working together, we believe we can learn from one another and learn to leverage the power of the arts and culture to address the urgent challenges of our time. Ending the global pandemic, tackling the climate crisis, and advancing equity, access, and justice. Our collective future 
hinges upon our ability to recognize our common humanity and to act together. As we seek to build back better and create a more sustainable, equitable, and inclusive future, your partnership means the world to us. We hope you see the summit as a canvas and a stage to exchange ideas, deepen relationships, and take action to heal our hemisphere and our world. I would like to thank the extraordinary staff team at the National Endowment for the Arts who helped organize this year's summit, including Christine Gant, Guillermo Ochoa, and Michael Orlov. I also want to extend a special thanks to Magdalena Moreno Mojita and our colleagues at Ithaca for their spirit of collaboration, innovation, and purpose. Once again, thank you for being with us. Thank you for shaping a fairer future where equity is paramount, where culture is a unifying force among nations, and where our collective policies center the wellness of our people and the planet. We are so very grateful for all that you do, and we hope that you enjoy the summit. Thank you. Hello, my name is Simon Bro. I am a white man with gray hair, and I'm wearing today a black suit. My accent is a French accent. I'm the director and CEO of the Canada Council for the Arts, and I'm also the chair of the International Federation of Arts Councils and Culture Agencies, IFICA. I would like to thank the National Endowment for the Arts for hosting this America's Cultural Summit and I would also like to congratulate Dr. Maria Rosario Jackson on her recent nomination as chair of the National Endowment for the Arts. We need this gathering now more than ever, as all of us here are called to build back better. This call comes in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. It also comes with a deeper understanding of the many pressing challenges our global community faces, like climate change, racism, and the legacies of colonialism and other social inequities. The Build Back Better principle aligns strongly with the theme of this summit towards a sustainable, equitable, and inclusive future, a theme that is actually at the heart of IFECA's work. This theme is top of mind around the world and not just at this summit. In 2021, for example, the G20 under the, the Italian presidency insisted on taking care of people and of our planet while ensuring a strong, inclusive, inclusive and sustainable recovery. This global project needs the cooperation of many sectors, health, the sciences, education, business, and agriculture, to name a few. But I do believe that our sector, arts and culture, has a unique and central role to play. Our work relates to three of the most important drivers for positive change in our society, empathy, innovation, and imagination. Empathy holds the power to mobilize large numbers of people to make change happen with heart and humility. Innovation and imagination help us to look at the issues we have anew, to develop creative solutions to address them. But before we forge ahead, I think it's important for all of us to reflect on the unique contributions the Americas can make to this global project. For one, I'm thinking of the strong presence of indigenous peoples across our continent. Indigenous peoples have a unique perspectives on the lands they'll, they've lived on since time immemorial. Their knowledge of the environment is crucial to a strong and adequate response to climate change. Similar, similarly, indigenous peoples' distinct and difficult experiences of colonization mean that they hold essential knowledge to create a more inclusive and equitable world. Of course, as a white settler, I'm not in a position to speak on behalf of indigenous peoples, but as a leader in the arts and culture, I have the influence 
and the responsibility to support the amplification of indigenous voices. We also need to consider how to support the diverse voices of migrants who have come to the Americas either by force or by choice and who have contributed immensely to the rich cultural landscape of their new homes. I invite all of us to reflect more on these and many other distinct realities and perspectives of our region that we need to bring to the fore. On behalf of my colleagues at the Canada Council for the Arts and on the, uh, and on the IFICA board, I look forward to rebuilding with all of you. Thank you, merci, gracias. Welcome to the America's Cultural Summit 2021. My name is Magdalena Moreno Mujica, and I'm the Executive Director of IFICA, the International Federation of Arts Councils and Culture Agencies. I am a female of medium height, olive skin, and curly brown hair. I'm wearing a yellow jacket, a blue top, and the green urban backdrop behind me is Gadigal land of the Eora Nation, known as Sydney, Australia. Yet I am from Chile, from the Americas, so I will continue now in my mother tongue of Spanish. Bienvenidas y bienvenidos a la Cumbre Cultural de las Américas 2021. Primero quisiera agradecer las importantes palabras del Fondo Nacional de las Artes, del Gobierno Federal de los Estados Unidos, del reconocimiento territorial de pueblos originarios realizado y también de las palabras de nuestro presidente de IFACA. IFACA es la red global de consejos de las artes y ministerios de cultura, dedicadas a impulsar una agenda cultural representando a más de 70 países, con la visión de un mundo en el que las artes y la cultura prosperen con sus múltiples contribuciones que sean reconocidas por sus gobiernos y sus pueblos. Mantenemos un compromiso colectivo con el diálogo, el intercambio internacional, dentro de un espíritu de solidaridad, inclusión, reciprocidad y aprendizaje mutuo. En este contexto es un gran honor reunirnos hoy con ustedes, representantes de gobierno, organismos públicos y del sector cultural y creativo de las Américas, para abordar temas críticos buscando reconstruir un futuro más equitativo, sostenible e inclusivo en esta agenda que es tan fundamental para el trabajo de IFACA también. En julio del 2019, al culminar la Cumbre Cultural de las Américas en Buenos Aires, nos despedimos con un anhelo de reencontrarnos en Washington, D.C. al año siguiente. Con nuestros colegas del Fondo Nacional comenzamos a imaginarnos, soñar y planificar un programa sólido de diálogo, de participación, junto a una parrilla programática excepcional, como sabemos se puede hacer en un lugar como Washington. El anhelo de estar reunidos fortalecía esta noción de encuentro, de compartir, de aprender, de reflexionar y de colaborar. Y bueno, no nos imaginábamos que vendría una pandemia. Sin embargo, el compromiso, la entrega, el diálogo, la increíble parrilla programática está, quizás virtual, pero está, con todas y todos ustedes presentes, abarcando la diversidad territorial de las Américas e incluso contando con algunos y algunas colegas de otros continentes. Nuestro programa está diseñado en cuatro partes. Hoy nos focalizaremos en entender las diversas perspectivas en una agenda de equidad e igualdad tanto lo logrado como enfrentarnos como comunidad internacional a lo mucho que está al debe. Tendremos plenarias, sesiones de respuesta y luego tendremos dos días de co-construcción y participación activa de mesas de trabajo. Y contaremos con cuatro visiones para la relatoría final. Todo esto estimulado y nutrido por un lenguaje creativo. Reconocemos que nuestros puntos de vista y contextos serán diversos y los enfoques en esta agenda a la vez variados. Pero tenemos la convicción que con un espíritu de solidaridad, diálogo e intercambio, daremos espacios para esta diversidad, para que nos una y nos ayude a entender mejor este mundo 
y estas Américas que valoramos tanto. La primera cumbre se realizó en Ottawa en el 2018. Ahí nace nuestra mariposa, gracias al Consejo de las Artes de Canadá. Nuestra mariposa cambia de color a medida que viaja y visita nuevos lugares. Es traviesa y muy linda y se transforma y busca cobija. Hoy nuestra mariposa color púrpura nos guía en estos cuatro días. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, Lin-Manuel Miranda here, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the 2021 America's Cultural Summit. I'm joining you all virtually from the unceded ancestral lands of the Muncie, Lenape, and Wappinger people on which New York City resides. Sitting in my office in front of a blue wall, I'm a Puerto Rican cis man in my early 40s. I'm wearing a cap and a dark brown shirt. My pronouns are he, him. Today we've gathered together individual artists and performers, cultural leaders, and funders throughout the Americas for the next three and a half days, you will be working collectively at laying a policy foundation, which will support a more sustainable, equitable, and inclusive artistic and cultural future for the region. When I first started studying theater, I didn't see many stories that represented me. I loved theater and was lucky that my parents had every cast album from Man of La Mancha to Hair, but it wasn't until I was in high school and saw Jonathan Larson's musical Rent that I realized I might have a life in the theater. Seeing stories of people living just downtown from me few years older than me, and the most incredible diversity I'd ever seen on a Broadway stage gave me the license to dream that one day I could be there too. And now I have the great fortune that the musicals I've made are out in the world and expanding the universe of roles for kids, teenagers, and emerging artists to see themselves represented. When someone has that opportunity to know that they could have a life in art, that's the first step to opening the doors wider. We don't know what they're gonna make five, 10, 20 years down the road. My favorite example of this is Maya Angelou. When I was assigned, I know why the caged bird sings in ninth grade English. I read it overnight and then devoured all her other books too. I learned she was a featured dancer in the first European tour of Porgy and Bess. This was her first glimpse at how black people were treated beyond the United States and made an indelible mark on her life. No doubt helping shape the artist she would go on to become. That was an opportunity that shaped her. This is what drives me to create more opportunities for people to see themselves represented, for people to be able to perform in these shows. It's not a surprise to me that the artists I've had the great privilege to collaborate with are already going on to make other incredible work in Hollywood and in theater and beyond. And I think we have yet to know the Maya Angelou is getting their start in school, regional, and international productions of In the Heights and the Hamilton Tours. I'm very proud that my work is a stepping stone or a line in a resume on so many of their artistic journeys. And this is why all of you here today are so important in expanding the universes of voices in the arts in your communities. Whether you're an artist, funder, or policymaker, we all have to be intentional about creating opportunities for new voices. I can't give you a formula for how to do this, but I can tell you that it's not enough to want to encourage diversity or make a statement about your intention to increase diversity. That's the first of many steps. It's not enough to separate diversity work in a silo. We have to weave efforts intentionally throughout all programs, policies, and initiatives. Throughout this conference, I encourage you to think about how you can create inclusive programs and policies. Thank you all for the great work you're about to embark on and to the National Endowment of the Arts for hosting and co-organizing along the IFACCA. And now I have the great pleasure to introduce Afro-Cuban band leader and musician, Juan de Marcos Gonzalez, with whom I had the great opportunity to collaborate on Viva. Hi friends, my name is uh, Juan de Marcos and I'm a Cuban musician representing my country. Uh, First, I would like to thank uh, Lin Manuel Miranda, the great American artist, for his introduction. And of course, uh, my brother, Michael Orloff, and IFACA, the National Endowment for the Arts. When I spoke with Mike about my participation in your summit, I thought initially to prepare a big band arrangement and make a, a thing with my band, but under the actual conditions, this is absolutely impossible. 
So I decided to go back to my style, the style that I recorded with the Buena Vista Social Club and picked a son by Nico Sakito, one of the greatest Cuban artists of the 20th century. This son is a hundred years old. I recorded all of the music, all the instruments, and had the helping hand of my uh, daughter, Glicerita Gonzalez, and my son, Jaure Muñiz, and my wife, Gliceria Abreu, was the camera woman. So this is a hundred years old son, written by Nico Saquito. It's an up-tempo and danceable son, acoustic, very nice, and I hope that you are going to enjoy it. Thank you very much for your invitation, and I hope that you are going to have a nice time during the summit. All the best. Tiene esa negra, qué mala entraña tiene, hombre. Ya ha trabajado con todos los muertos para virar del mundo al revés. Siempre en santos y en cabildo, y nunca falta ningún bebé. Porque ella vive solo pensando que mi cabeza llegue a los pies. Me tenían amarrado, te amarrado, hombre. Pero me solté. de un tarro viejo sacaba polvo para el café y me lo daba la muy maldita para virarme el mundo al revés también me daba polvo de sapo porque con eso me hincha los pies y todo eso para amarrarme pero ya ves que me le pide me tenían amarrado con Con mejor ana y flor de café Te hace la puerta siempre tenía el retrato mío puesto al revés Hacía un saumerio y un reguijo y lo tiraba por la pared Y todo eso para amarrarme pero ya ves que me le escapé Me tenían amarrado y amarrado con me Pero que ella no tenía nada más. Ella me arrao con pe. 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 Me tenía pero me solté. Me tenía nada más. Me tenía pero me solté. Esa negrita lo que quería es que mi cabeza repito vieja lo que ella me tenía nada más. Ella me arrao con pe.
Ani Bojo, my name is Jesse Wente, I'm chair of the Canada Council for the Arts, and welcome to Plenary One, the Equity Agenda in the Americas, what social and cultural fault lines exacerbate inequities in the Americas, and who controls the dial. We'll hear from three panel members, Esther Hernandez-Torres, the Director General of Cultural Engagement and the Secretary of Culture for Mexico, Hillary Brown, Program Manager, Culture and Community Development for CARICOM Secretariat in Guyana, and Angelique Power, President and CEO of the Skillman Foundation. The questions they are responding to were, as an introduction, what would you say are the burning issues to address inequities in your context? What social and or cultural fault lines do you believe exacerbate inequities in the Americas and have these shifted since the pandemic? Over the next four days, we will discuss a range of complex and critical issues towards achieving a more sustainable, equitable, and inclusive future. What message would you send to all the delegates for this task ahead? Their responses are coming up. ¿Qué tal? Buen día. Soy Esther Hernández Torres y me encuentro en mi oficina en la Secretaría de Cultura en la Ciudad de México. Eh, diría que eh, las problemáticas principales tienen que ver con las desigualdades, ya sea por pobreza, por exclusión, por violencias. En el caso de México, eh, las desigualdades implican una falta de, eh, de ejercicio de nuestros derechos, de derechos humanos, pero entre ellos también los derechos culturales. En México, en los distintos estados y municipios, pues hay diferentes violencias, ¿no? desde, que va, desde las que van por violencias criminales hasta también violencia doméstica, de género, intrafamiliar. Y todo ello eh, implica una vulnerabilidad a los grupos minoritarios. Estos grupos minoritarios, si se suman, en realidad son la mayoría de la población. Entonces creo que eh, hay que abordar los programas y acciones de una manera efectiva para que se incluya a todas las personas. Eh, esto, estas acciones tienen que derivar en políticas públicas que apunten a la escucha y al diálogo, a la participación activa con pleno respeto a las diversidades. Eh, es un principio fundamental no dejar a nadie atrás, no dejar a nadie afuera. En ese eh, contexto, en el Programa Sectorial de Cultura, derivado del Plan Nacional de Desarrollo eh, en México, el objetivo prioritario número uno indica reducir la desigualdad en el ejercicio de los derechos culturales de personas y comunidades, prioritariamente en contextos de vulnerabilidad, con su participación en procesos que fortalezcan los ciclos, prácticas e identidades culturales. De esta manera, es necesario seguir trabajando en políticas culturales que transiten hacia la autonomía de las culturas, políticas que dialoguen con las distintas identidades, modos de vida, territorios y comunidades, y en las que el Estado sea un elemento de diálogo y participación activa de la ciudadanía para generar una cultura de derechos. Pues las líneas divisorias considero principalmente que son aquellas provocadas por el racismo y el clasismo, que generan distintos tipos de discriminación, ya sea discriminación de género, discriminación lingüística, por edad, ¿no? por, eh, por educación, por creencias religiosas, etc. También eh, en esta época las crisis de movilidad, migración, la crisis climática, son eh, aquellas líneas que provocan que haya desigualdades o que se exacerben las desigualdades en América. En el caso de la pandemia por COVID-19, todo lo que tuvo que ver, tiene que ver todavía con aislamiento social, desempleo, violencia intrafamiliar, la violencia de género, la crisis médica, los suicidios, que fue un caso que es un caso muy grave, sobre todo entre la población joven. Eh, es importante considerar todas estas problemáticas para apuntar hacia la equidad social y cultural como una responsabilidad compartida, explorar nuevas y diversas prácticas para hacer culturas, este, políticas culturales más inclusivas y examinar cómo podemos fortalecer y revitalizar el acceso y la participación cultural en todo el espectro de la sociedad. 
eh, mientras reconstruimos nuestros sectores en un context contexto post-COVID, podemos demostrar el potencial del sector de las artes y la cultura para brindar liderazgo en el ejemplo a otros sectores. Muchos gobiernos de todo el mundo hemos destacado a la equidad, la diversidad y la inclusión como impulsores clave en este sentido. Eh, si la gente puede verse reflejada en su entorno, en el arte, en sus culturas, entonces estamos hablando de una sociedad más equitativa. Eh, considero que hay varias acciones que debemos impulsar. La primera es creer creer en el poder transformador del arte y la cultura en nuestras sociedades. Eh, si partimos de ese poder transformador, entonces podemos plantear políticas públicas que nos permitan codiseñar, diseñar en conjunto con la ciudadanía, así como evaluar todo lo que está sucediendo desde los estados con la gente con la, que, eh, con la que se trabajan estas políticas. También es fundamental actuar en favor de los derechos culturales, no solamente para el acceso, porque eso es algo que se repite cotidianamente. Tenemos que apostar también por la participación y por la contribución de la cultura a la población en general. Eh, si basamos las estrategias en los principios de diversidad, equidad, inclusión y accesibilidad, entonces estamos planteando un futuro más sostenible en cuanto a, eh, a lo que puede aportar la política cultural en este sentido. Se trata de tener un, un desarrollo cultural que sea sobre todo humano, que respete las diversidades, que trabaje en un sentido de transformación, en un sentido de respeto a las diversidades culturales, a las culturas vivas, del fortalecimiento a los grupos, a las organizaciones, a las comunidades que trabajan por el bien común. Eh, la cultura pensada desde lo local como con un sentido colaborativo, tienden eh, un camino hacia la sostenibilidad y hacia el buen vivir. También es importante empezar a dialogar sobre economías creativas, solidarias, sobre temas que eh, piensen a la creatividad para el aprendizaje en comunidad, que piensen a la creatividad como ese elemento detonante, pero la creatividad sin comunidad será otra vez el ego de unos cuantos trabajando por sí mismos. La cuestión es articular estos dos puntos para entonces tener políticas culturales más justas. Muchas gracias. First, let me express my profound appreciation to IFACO and to the National Endowment of the Arts for the kind invitation to participate in the Americas Cultural Summit 2021, and to represent the Caribbean community, CARICOM, which is an intergovernmental grouping of 15 member states and five associate members. I think we all agree that we are passing through an unprecedented and pivotal moment in the history of humanity, where the global community is simultaneously grappling with a crippling health crisis in the COVID-19 pandemic, is reckoning with deeply entrenched systemic racism and xenophobia, and with the increasing effects of climate change, which are especially relevant to small island developing states in the Caribbean. I will be focusing on the axes of discrimination related to age, gender, and race. And in this context, the burning issues to address inequality are first, recognition of how entrenched equality is in every sphere of our lives, from the more obvious economic disparities to the more insidious issues of access, opportunity, and recognition based on social status. We urgently need to step up research and advocacy to highlight the many gaps, the gender gap, the wage, wealth, employment, and health gaps, and gaps in access to services. And finally, we need the political will in government and the resolve of the leadership of private corporations to put the necessary policies and programs in place to effect change. If it is one thing we all learned from the George Floyd global race protests in 2020, it was the power of advocacy of the people, which has given rise 
to a global public-private sector movement to effect change. There are several intersecting axes of discrimination or fault lines that exacerbate inequality in the Americas. I will focus attention on three of them today, on gender, age, and race, for which I have oversight responsibility in CARICOM. In spite of the many gains towards gender equality, women are still in the minority in leadership positions where, for example, Women are heads of state or government in only 22 countries globally, and one in CARICOM, and make up only a quarter of national parliamentarians, according to the United Nations. Globally and in the Caribbean, one in three women, 15 to 64 years, have experienced abuse from an intimate partner. And since the onset of the pandemic, sadly, gender-based violence and unemployment has increased dramatically for women, but so has the burden of care increased with children out of school due to school, school closures. And of course, there's the care of the elderly and so many other responsibilities. Turning now to youth as another important fault line in the Americas, UN ECLAC reported that 42% of the Caribbean's population is under 25 years and 60% under 30 years. Young people in the Caribbean are disproportionately affected by unemployment at 25%, that is three times the adult average, affected by poverty, and are more likely to be victims and perpetrators of violent crime and to have unintended pregnancies. These challenges in turn negatively impact their life outcomes to function as productive citizens in their respective countries in the Americas. By not addressing the gaps in relation to youth, we are not taking advantage of the demographic dividend we have so strongly in our favor by having such a youthful population to secure the future of the Americas and realize unprecedented growth and development. Finally, I would like to speak to the race and social justice reparations agenda that is being championed by CARICOM heads of government. Evidence shows that the historical and crippling legacy of centuries of enslavement and its attendant dehumanizing ideology of racism is fundamentally at the core of contemporary reality of persistent poverty among people of African descent and systemic anti-black racism. This is manifest in unequal access to employment, education, health care, housing and other services, and in unequal treatment by justice systems. Slavery in the Americas systematically extracted the wealth of the region for over 300 years leading to our underdevelopment and that of Africa, while fueling two industrial revolutions and tremendous growth and development in Europe. It is in this context in 2013 that CARICOM heads of government took the historic decision to establish the CARICOM Reparations Commission to pursue reparations for native genocide slavery and the transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans from the relevant European nations. The excellent work of the Commission under the chairmanship of highly acclaimed Caribbean historian and educator, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, has inspired a global movement for reparatory justice by providing intellectual leadership and serving as the vanguard of the global movement on reparations. This historical context is a source of great inequality between nations, which urgently needs to be addressed as a global community. I would like to transmit a message of hope and encouragement to everyone gathered for the America Summit and to focus our attention on the transformative role that culture can and does play in development. It has been said that in addition to the economic, social, and environmental dimensions, culture is the fourth and perhaps central pillar of sustainable development by virtue of the contribution culture makes to the other three dimensions and its unique role in promoting social justice, empowerment, participation, and equality in relation to youth, women, 
indigenous people and other marginalized groups, as I've highlighted today. Culture serves as both enabler and driver of sustainable development by providing unique historical and contemporary context, cultural value and assets that facilitate sustainable, inclusive development outcomes. Cultural expressions born out of the people's experience and in the Caribbean context, musical expressions like reggae from Jamaica, compa from Haiti, punta from Belize, Steel Pan and Calypso from Trinidad and Tobago have in a profound way allowed the voices of the dispossessed and marginalized to be heard in development processes in the region. Globally recognized and highly celebrated voices like those of Bob Marley and Peter Tosh from Jamaica have reverberated in every corner of the globe calling for social justice, equality, and civil rights. The Cultural Times report in 2015 highlighted that the creative economy employs more persons aged 15 to 29 than any other sector in the economy. And as such, creative industry development to facilitate wealth creation and employment should be central to national development strategies in the Americas and should form a critical part of any strategy to address inequality in relation to youth. CARICOM is no doubt best known for its outstanding artists and the diversity of our cultural expressions and the dominance of our athletes in especially track and field in international games. We are a region that punches way above our weight relative to our small size, small markets and population, and it is primarily culture and sports that has brought this recognition to our region. So as we deliberate together, over the coming days on promoting sustainable, equitable, and an inclusive future. Let us therefore use culture as that overarching framework in which to devise meaningful and impactful solutions. Hi, my name is Angelique Power, and I am sitting on the contemporary and ancestral homelands of the three Ashinaabe nations of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. And today, 30,000 Native Americans live in the Detroit metro area. I'm zooming to you from my new home. We moved in last week. I am in my home office. Behind me are books and art pieces, and just out of view, is complete chaos with unpacked boxes spilling into piles on the floor. I am honored to be with you today. First, my context is that I work at a private independent foundation in the city of Detroit that focuses on children and youth. And our entire purpose at the Skillman Foundation is to listen to young people and unlock equity so that they can achieve their boldest dreams. We do this for them of course, but equally of note, we do this for each of us. Children are the barometer for equity, especially black and brown and white children in under-resourced communities. If children are thriving, then collectively we are thriving. If children are suffering, then collectively we suffer today and we suffer tomorrow. So at Skillman, we do this work with young people, guided by their insights, their ideas, and their desires. If you don't already know, let me tell you, Detroit is a pulsating city. It is the heartbeat of Michigan. Lined with endless rivers, Detroit offers an international border. It has exquisite restaurants, it has a crackling art and music scene, giants in business, small business, as well as large corporations. And Detroit is also a black city with about 80% of our residents being African-American like me. And above and beyond that, there is a mix of other races and ethnicities, Latinx communities, Muslim communities, Jewish communities, 
Native American communities, there's just a mix of language and cultural practices that light up the 138 square miles that make up the city. Known also as the Motor City, Detroit first put the world on wheels from its dominating auto industry. And when that same industry tumbled, the city also lost its footing. And so in equal measure, the history and the story of Detroit involved the struggles of the auto industry and the aftermath of a city working to rebuild itself from the brink of decimation. So this has defined the city of Detroit as well as the character of Detroiters. Detroit versus everybody is the theme here, which means Detroit versus the doubters, Detroit versus the extractors, Detroit versus the bystanders. Detroiters are part grinders and part dreamers, and it's a city that is powered by sheer will and the belief that if you show up and you try hard enough and you dig deep enough, then anything will be possible. And this is exactly what led me and my family to pack up our belongings this summer while the pandemic continues to rage and to find a new home in this place. It is the Detroit ethos that in order to live here, you cannot just talk about problems. You cannot just focus on inequities. You have to show up and be part of the solution. And now being part of the solution starts with telling the truth. And the truth is that even in a black and brown city, you can have systems that are designed against black and brown people. You can have an education system that is emaciated and underfunded and in desperate need of teachers and principals of color that reflect young black and brown faces that are looking for role models. You can have a bustling business sector in which few C-suites and boardrooms are led by black people. You can have a quickly bifurcating economy where those who have a post-secondary degree have a passport into the knowledge economy. And that means that you can work from home. You can be surrounded by books and art. You could have digital connectivity to the world. You can have health insurance, paid time off. You can afford to buy a new home and record messages of reflection broadcast on stable Wi-Fi to different countries around the world. Burning issues are really that even in a majority black and brown space, the default operating systems continue to churn on exquisitely designed racist practices. And so a total systems rethink is needed. And what does that mean? This is language we use all the time. How does one build a liberatory anti-racist education, economic and justice system that's fed by the art and music and fed by the ingenuity that makes up these 138 square miles? This is the core question. What does a systems rethink look like in practice? And if we don't do it now, the window is closing. We have more dollars coming in in the United States from the federal government than we've seen. And we have a collective understanding that systemic racism is the cause of our collective woes. This is our moment. This is the city to figure it out. The city of dreamers and doers. To address inequity, we need to focus here on what systems change means in real time with real consequences. So keep an eye on us. These past 18 months have been as close to a living biblical story as it gets. The, the world pauses, the, the sky is quiet. There is an invisible sickness that harms each of us and the only way out of it is to protect ourselves and simultaneously protect each other. And while the last 18 months have been a trip and have been so critical, what we do in the next 18 months will determine what type of biblical parable this actually is. If we emerge from the pandemic without having a collective understanding of how race 
racism, caste systems, colorism, white protectionism and supremacism manifest inside of systems, inside of each of our institutions and inside of ourselves, then the fault lines that we have identified will only exacerbate and the difference will be that we will be knowingly complicit. So across our different countries and this world, a good place to start is actually with young people. These last 18 months, it was young people who led the uprisings, young people who are demanding completely new systems. They do not believe in returning to what was or marginally tweaking through reform. They want to accelerate massive change in this moment. And so we not only have to listen to young people, we need to set them as designers of our destiny. This is a time to practice the fading art of assuming positive intent. We're living in a time where we are prone to decimate someone's character because we disagree with their opinions. And my mind can jump here too, because language can often trigger trauma in ourselves or in other people. And so because of that, we often choose to not even share our boldest ideas for fear that our words won't carry from our minds to meaning. So to build something new and the task over the next four days, we need to recognize that not only do we share a common fate, which we learned through this pandemic, but we have to believe that while we're coming at it from vastly different places, we share a common vision too. Meaning we all want engaging, dynamic, incredible schools. We all want to live in nurturing, closely knit communities. And we all wanna spend our hours doing spiritually rewarding work. So if we start with what we share, Rather than fixate on where we diverge, we have an opportunity to be bound together in our work as opposed to uh, binded apart. And so over the next few days, I would say offer grace to one another, clarify, offer opposing views, but stretch toward understanding. Ultimately, this is our goal not only for the summit, but this is our goal in life, to emerge with a deeper understanding of very complex ideas, to be able to sit with opposing thoughts and not seek immediate resolution, but believe that in time, the meaning will reveal itself to us. So I say, until then, offer each other mercy and offer each other extra warmth for the journey we've all taken to get here and the journey that is ahead of us. Ani, bonjour. Uh, my name is uh, Jesse Wenti. I'm an uh, Anishinaabe uh, writer and uh, uh, arts person. I'm currently the chair of the Canada Council for the Arts and thank you so much for joining us for today's uh, panel. Uh, I'm going to allow my guests to introduce themselves in a moment. One of our guests, uh, Susi Callejas, the uh, Culture Minister of El Salvador, uh, has not joined us as of yet, but she may join us during the course of this call, and we would certainly welcome her there. But in the meantime, we do have a very distinguished panel to react to some of the videos uh, that we've just seen. So I would like to bring on uh, first uh, Judith Morrison, if you want to introduce yourself and say hi, Judith. Jesse, it's truly a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much for the, the introduction. My name is Judith Morrison. I'm the Senior Advisor for Social Development at the Inter-American Development Bank here in Washington. I've got a white background. Um, I am wearing a dark black blazer and have long brown curly hair. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Judith. And uh, I would also like to welcome Neil Kang, to the conversation. Emil, can you say hi and introduce yourself? Yes, Jesse, it's a pleasure to, to be with you here as well. And um, my name is Emil Kang. I am the program director for arts and culture 
at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Uh, I use uh, he, him, his pronouns, and I'm coming to you from uh, the unceded lands of Lenape Hoking, otherwise known as Manhattan, New York City. And I am sitting um, at a desk um, wearing a blue shirt and blue uh, blazer with glasses. Uh, and uh, I am an Asian American male uh, in my 50s uh, and uh, have a white wall behind me with a small painting by my uh, late uncle. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for that, uh, Emil. And for those uh, listening, I'm an Anishinaabe uh, man with wearing a red checked shirt with blue glasses sitting in front of a wall with uh, various posters and artworks uh, on them. And it is so great to be here with both Judith and uh, Mio. We watched what I thought were those very compelling videos uh, by Ingeek and Esther. And I guess I'd just like to start, I guess, feeling your response to those um, videos. And did they speak to the context that you are working in? Let's start with Judith. Definitely. We heard about what's happening in the Americas in a very particular place in Detroit and also contrasted that with what's happening in Latin America, which is very much the way I feel. Um, I live in the United States and do a lot of work in Latin America and obviously with the pandemic haven't had a lot of opportunities to travel to the region. So it's always wonderful to hear um, from voices from the from Latin America. And I think for me, one of the most important and interesting aspects of the conversation, it reminded me actually of something that I just saw yesterday. Yesterday, I was watching a watching some middle schoolers play soccer, and at the middle, at, during several points in the discussion, and or in several points during the game, there was a young man there who was actually doing powwow fancy dancing as he was waiting in between the different sessions, and it just showed me how people express their culture and how they are in so many different and important ways and how this culture is really the resilience and the importance of the Americas. So when we think about the region, we know that over 40% of people in Latin America and the Caribbean are of indigenous or African descent. So we know that this is the strength of the region. We also have some understanding that this is probably an undercount, um, particularly for the indig indigenous peoples in the region. We talk about 10%, um, but many of us that work there know that those numbers are much, much higher. What happens with indigenous identity when people leave their territorial lands physically, they're very much attuned with the cosmovisions and what's happening in their territories. And there are many ways that they're still connected. So we know that this diversity is part of the resilience. It's the resilience of Detroit, but it's also the resilience of every pocket and every corner in the Americas. That it's this resilience, it's the culture that gives us the ability to move forward, the ability to think about next steps. Now, Esther was also very eloquent in the way that she discussed economics and economic aspects of the region. Um, thinking a little bit also about the generation of jobs and the creation of jobs. And I just wanted to mention that right before COVID-19, we know that cultural jobs in and of themselves represented over $100 billion in industry in the region. What this means also is that it represents over 2 million jobs. Now, we don't know what's happening now, but I would argue that it's quite possible that we have even more cultural jobs now than we did then. Why? Because we have tools and technology that enable people to share their cultures in many dynamic ways. Many young people have taken advantage of technology and tools. Um, as we heard Angelique mention that it is a privilege and it's a true privilege to be able to join you remotely to have a decent and adequate internet connection. And those tools and the creative ways that young people throughout the Americas have been using these tools to share directly aspects of their culture is fascinating and exciting. And I think it's an area that has tremendous potential in terms of job growth, but also in terms of dialogue and discussion. So I know that for me, culture is what's gotten me through um, this very rough and difficult time. I think it's always what gets people through. And even in the moments when we're still, our culture manifests itself and we can see our culture. So if we're waiting at halftime at a soccer game, we may be expressing our culture in a way that makes us feel good, a way that comforts us, and in a, also in a way that reflects who we are in the most profound and deepest ways. Well, thank you so much uh, for that. I, I agree with everything you said and I I was struck that for kids they've in this time they've created cultural jobs that didn't exist even five years ago if we look at you know I know young indigenous folks who got a few million followers on TikTok and that's their career now 
and that didn't even exist uh, two or three years ago. Emil, I'm wondering for you, what resonated while you were watching those videos? Well, I think I'm um, along the same lines, but uh, I'll maybe expand upon something a, a bit, um, a, a, just a, a, a bit di diver not divergent, but just a, a bit different. Um, you know, the Mellon Foundation is um, uh, the, one of the largest funders of the arts and humanities in our country. And um, we, we come from a specific time. The wealth that was gathered comes from a specific time. And we acknowledge the, uh, how, the role that philanthropy has played in the in incredible inequities and disparities that exist in this country in the United States alone. And at the same time, as we think about our work um, as funders uh, in the arts and humanities, we have historically uh, centered our support all around institutions. And I really um, ad admired both um, of the plenaries that we heard from both Esther and from Angelique in that they talked also specifically about the empowerment of individuals, of people. Um, in, in Angelique's comments, she talked about children and the role, the role of young people, the young, young people demanding change. And in Esther's um, talk, she talked about the importance of co-designing change um, with, with citizens and people uh, in, in community. And I really do think that um, what for us has been very interesting as a funder is to reimagine how we think about the role of um, philanthropy in the work of the art sector and the distinction between supporting institutions versus supporting individuals, especially as change agents. And what are we doing as philanthropy to actually um, to uh, invest in new models that actually uh, create self-sufficiency among individuals to uh, empower themselves for change as opposed to having them rely on existing institutions. And so the, the, they both touched on systems change work in, 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 one, in Angelique's way, of course she names it that way, but I think they both do. And I believe really the real, the pivoting and the shifting the way we think about the role of institutions versus individuals is really what got me, got me going. I thank you so much for that, Emil. I think it's a really interesting point. One that I think um, the Canada Council is certainly working on uh, north of the medicine line in terms of thinking about, you know, how to make sure, certainly just even in our pandemic relief, the focus was as much on individuals as it was on institutions. And uh, of course, if you want change, I think one of the things is though the change agents probably don't exist at the institutions that have been funded for many, many years. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and I would say that I think that uh, thinking that uh, that uh, funding different kinds of institutions um, is actually addressing equity, I think is flawed as well, that we actually have to, have to understand who has never been at the table, what institutions don't exist because they've never had those opportunities. And how do we support, invest in new structures that actually relate to the times of today as opposed to when those institutions were created? And so for America, of course, it look, really looks at issues of everything from, from tax structures and corporate structures to the role of, of, of different um, things that we learned during the pandemic, including the power of the collaborative, of solidarity, the economy, of um, mutual aid societies, and all the other kinds of uh, entities that can be created that it retains power to the individual. Um, and at the, at the same time as well, allows them to have the, the strength of, of numbers to create change in our society. Mm. One thing just on that point, um, I think Esther in, in mentioned very eloquently the amount of financial resources. And she said, this is a moment where the US government is investing more than ever. And at the Inter-American Development Bank, we invest, um, we are members, are members that are from Latin America. We also have a board of directors that includes um, countries from throughout the world. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is that in this moment of recovery and moment also of figuring out what's next, there are lots of resources that are being used and it's important that these voices, these culturally diverse voices are sitting around the table. And sitting around the table means including aspects of culture of development with identity when we're thinking about public policies and programs. And that's something that's a huge priority when we think about some of the previous work of the Inter-American Development Bank, helping to create action plans for marginalized populations, whether it's African 
African descendants, for indigenous peoples, but it's also part of the importance of our vision 2025, which is about economic recovery and employment recovery. So, so to make sure that those young indigenous peoples and that young people and, and, and others who are coming into these digital platforms with themselves and with a product that's very authentic, that they can actually generate a revenue from, which I think for a lot of us who are older, we don't quite understand how that works, but this is the innovation. This is the cutting edge. This is where the experiment happens. We're also seeing it happen in STEM. And I just wanted to give you a very quick example. We're actually looking right now at a venture capital fund that is going to be financing and funding indigenous peoples, African descendants, LGBTQ plus members of communities in creating innovative and exciting technological solutions to start to envision this 2025 in a way that's more inclusive and more participatory. And I wanna just give a very quick example. About a year and a half ago, right, well, maybe a little more now, right before COVID hit the United States, it was fascinating. I, um, a group of us received a number of tech, fintech entrepreneurs who were all Afro-descendant women from Brazil. There were six or seven of them who were working exclusively in the fintech space. So financial technology for banking to expand banking to, to vulnerable and disadvantaged communities in a way that included their vision and their way of thinking about funding and financing and saving. So I think there are a lot of ways that this kind of innovation and technology, use of technology gives us a lot of opportunities to rethink how we reconstruct and rebuild this world, which is something that I also think Angelique mentioned several times. It's not gonna be business as usual. It's gonna be a very different kind of world than what many of us grew up with. And that's actually, I think, a very exciting and promising thing. I mean, for sure, it can't be this, it can't be the same world that was going to be. That path is is gone uh, to us. I wonder, because I think you're, we've seen in Canada enormous investment, you know, historic investment into the cultural sector in the past few years, even preceding the uh, the pandemic with the doubling of the, the Canada Council's budget. To me, though, as someone who's worked in the sector for most of their lives, while I think some heralded it as this sort of great investment, I think for a lot of us who come from marginalized communities, it has seemed more as a, a long time coming addressing or redressing of, of stand, standing issues. And I think there's concern that when we emerge from the pandemic, we might see less investment and that we might actually lose some of the evening of the ground that these investments have actually allowed organizations to do. How do we make sure that the gains that we may have achieved because of this crisis, as odd as it seems that there's been this recognition of the importance of culture and, and the need for cultural workers, how do we make sure that doesn't go away once the pandemic is over? Well, Jesse, maybe I can just jump in and just sure. say, I don't necessarily have the answers to those really important questions uh, because they're fairly um, enormous, but I, I do think that um, uh, what we have to acknowledge, firstly, is that and obviously I'm coming at it from the role of arts and culture. And so what I do say really is, is, is in that frame, but that the, um, uh, we actually must acknowledge that the arts sector is much broader than, than the institutions in, in it. Uh, and that we uh, have to find ways to acknowledge the, the, that artists are workers uh, and that they work across multiplicity of labor markets. And, and that their impact on the economy is far beyond the output uh, uh, that they, they generate. I think that there's, a, uh, there's been a long standing, and, and I think, again, this is very specific to, this, to the United States, but with the, with the creation of the whole nonprofit model, we have a, a system that actually does um, uh, uh, maintain wealth disparity, to be perfectly frank, and uh, addresses, it doesn't allow um, artists to see pathways for them to build out successful careers that actually allow them to both uh, make a living as well as pursue the complexities of their practices. We know in many cases that many artists are thinking about when they think about their practice beyond their own work, that the next thing is to create another, another nonprofit organization. We need to get beyond that to actually allow them to be able to both integrate their practice, any kind of activism, the, the social change work, so that there actually can be a holistic approach to the value that artists have. I think. This again, this bifurcation of identity and, 
and the, also the, the sort of the real um, the, the placing of, of arts as charity has has really limited the ability for us to be able to um, I think um, benefit from the, the innovation and in, across other sectors in terms of um, uh, the the value of, of making a profit and I don't understand why somehow artists making money is a bad thing. It shouldn't be a bad thing. It should be a good thing. And how can we actually invest in, in structures, economic structures that allow artists to do that? I think that's part of the answer to your question. And that, and it, that this part of the, the, the national dialogue is really about elevating artists to that status. Here, here. I mean, if, if we're gonna live in capitalism, everyone making money should be a good yeah. thing at the very least. Exactly. Uh, Judith, how do we keep what we've got? It's a great question, and I think it's a question that goes to resilience. One of the downsides of recognizing the resilience, um, certainly of, of indigenous and, and African descendant communities and peoples is that that resilience means that there's a lot of tapping into that talent, that, that ability to persevere, um, even you know, vision of, of, of philosophies, cosmovisions. These are all things that have been, we've all been in dire need of um, over the last almost two years. I think the question is that we can't bank on that resiliency um, for the long-term without longer-term commitments for what will happen to those resources. And it's not a fad. I mean, I think one of the challenges is that, um, you know, obviously there was the Black Lives Matter moment and there've been another, a number of discussions about racial reckoning. They affect all of the Americas. Um, we've seen examples of this in a number of countries, whether it's Colombia, whether it's Brazil, and there's been a real kind of social upheaval and discussion about what's right and what's equitable. And I think the way to continue that conversation is to not leave it in just spaces or discussions of specific groups, but to really talk about how do we have a platform that talks about equity? How do we make sure that we're including people, that we're providing human opportunities that are equitable? And I think one of the ways, just to link to what Emil was saying earlier, you know, what's the difference between an artist and crafts person and an artist? I mean, I think these are questions for us that we grapple with and often, it depends on who's producing the art, right? If it's someone who's producing the art, who's from a lower income background or from a racial or culturally distinct background, it is then artist and craft, or it's something that should be available and consumed by all um, and no one should profit from it that's part of the actual community. So I think when we think about these power dynamics, what's equity, what is participation, what is a job, this is where we get into a space where we can reinvent and really be creative with the ways that we think about culture and the ways that we think about work and the ways that we think about access. Oh, I think that's so fascinating. You know, the, in in my language, Anishinaabe, there's no word for artist uh, because it wasn't considered a part or, or a, a part from you or something that you would, it was just, something everyone did it was not it was not um separated so it's always interesting that we now is segmented and i and i think many communities don't necessarily view it that that it's separate and um i find it so interesting to you know one of the benefits and it's maybe not maybe that's a poor choice of language but one of the results of the pandemic i think is that the understanding of the value of culture maybe is more present than it has been in our minds because we we've relied on it to help us through and in in we all know this where placing that value on art and culture is so hard we've done it a million different ways in canada it's been the economic argument for a full generation now and i now, I now think there's pushback about just talking about the economic benefits of art production and culture because the pandemic shows that is enough it's way more important uh, than that so i do think we have to measure it and to get to touch on what judith said at the end there and i think reflects something esther said access and what i love what esther said was it's not just access that we have to measure it's also participation and contributions and I think so often we can get caught up in access, which is a problem, access, but it's not the be all and end all access. And so I wonder if I could get you both to maybe reflect a bit about how we, we move just past those notions of what success actually looks like and how we measure how, we measure how we're doing and where we're going. Um, 
You know, I think the, the concept of access is fraught in the sense that uh, people, it's such a used overused term that I think it's, it becomes sort of part of our own subconscious and we don't even recognize what, what we mean when we use terms like access. Uh, I would say that I think the, that for too long, and, and, and again, and this is really from the arts and culture sector, uh, when we think of access, we, we think about it from a participation slash audience perspective. We think about the public having access to art. And I think that's very important. Uh, obviously, we, that was what we want. But I also think that what that has done over time is actually um, is diminish the, the true um, value that the artist should have and the right the artist should have just to make work for themselves and for the right for the artist to get paid for their work. And so the, the distinction between valuing the output of the artist versus the artists themselves, I think is a, is a major shift, would be a major shift. And also trying to actually create structures, economic structures that actually goes right to the heart of the artist as, as workers. And I go back to that again, um, as opposed to the output of that artist. These are for me, the distinctions of trying to figure out who has access to the, to the economic models to allow them to, to be self-sufficient and successful uh, in the economy that we find ourselves in today, whatever that is. And how do we ensure that everyone has access to those models of the economy, as opposed to simply who has access to the art that these artists make, which again, I want to just restate, I think is important, but I think it's only part of the, the larger conversation. One thing I, I wanted to say about this is I think that when we talk about, there are a number of, of levels here. We're talking about, um, there's there are certainly some access issues in terms of access to resources to produce the art. And I'm thinking specifically in the digital space um, at the Inter-American Development Bank, we've been doing a lot of work to better understand digital divides and digital gaps. So we know that you know, an Afro-Brazilian woman headed household is 14% less likely to ha have access to a high speed internet connection. So that means that that household will not be able to access telehealth, will not be able to access job markets, will not be able um, to access teleschool, which is a huge issue, particularly when we're looking at these digital gaps. Um, what happened during the pandemic is that many people who were indigenous actually who had opportunities to tele work or sometimes even to tell a school, tell education, weren't able to go back to their traditional ancestral lands because they didn't have high speed internet mm -hmm. connections and they weren't able to avail themselves of those opportunities. So I do think there are certain spaces where we need to be talking you know, about providing access, but I think the question is how do we provide that access? And how do we maybe even go beyond individual models to think a little bit about collective models? Mm -hmm. So when Jesse talks about the artist, who is producing in a way that's collective and part of their collective responsibility to community. Wouldn't it be great if the benefits from that, that act are collective as well? So maybe the artist doesn't get paid for it, but maybe the community gets a huge benefit that's decided using traditional ancestral ways that's done in a way that's equitable. And so I wanted to just give a very quick example. We know, and, and working at a development bank, we, we've done a lot of kind of COVID relief and also talked a lot about ways of giving cash transfers and also food transfers because there've been so many really dire situations. And one of the things that we've learned is that often when you look at communities and particularly indigenous communities, um, tra traditional indigenous communities, collective communities, that people want to have a say in terms of how resources are distributed. They're not living in an individual way and they're surely not living in a nuclear community way. So I think one way of maybe turning the question on the head, on its head is to think, how can we make sure that we go beyond the individual and we think a little bit more collectively. And that collective expression has all sorts of ways that we might do things differently. So instead of giving cash directly, maybe we would do a communal transfer of benefits mm -hmm. or resources. Maybe instead of purchasing a bag of goods from traditional suppliers, we would identify where are their indigenous or local communities that are producing foods, food goods that are more traditionally appropriate to the communities that may be lower cost and may help to support a healthy supply chain in the community. So, and I think this is something for me that when I think about this collective notion, that's that's what makes some of the, the discussion around COVID, we all know how important community is. <laughs> we know that if we don't have community or connections or notion of collective, 
it's depressing. <laughs> you get sick. There are all sorts of ways that we've been cut off from that collective. And I think that's a way that we can think about the resilience. The resilience really that we've learned is the resilience and the importance of the collective. Oh, you're, you're speaking my language, uh, uh, Judith. Because um, to me, the pandemic has really been um, what it is what it is sort of uh, focused on or its vector of attack is community because it means that we have to keep apart from one another um and yet the solutions rely in community solutions in terms of yes we keep apart from each other and we do this to care for one another and that it means eventually we'll get to gather again quicker and yet our systems have not done well by adapting to that community and when you talk about individual versus community we start down this road i can't help myself i mean i watch those two videos i i i i talk a lot at diversity and equity and inclusion and all these sorts of issues that we're facing in the entirety of the americans and to me they're all rooted in the colonial history of these yeah. places like that's where all of this comes from and here we are i'm the chair of a crown corporation we've got someone from an internet you know i'm wondering it's interesting where we're sitting having this conversation in terms of the roles we are are, are doing how do our organizations which haven't always been you know the best at this how do we tackle what th this fundamental issue, which is that we're really in 2021, all trying to unpack the legacy of colonialism and what it has meant to the people in this place. And it, it's certainly challenging, but I'm interested that we're doing this at organizations that um, are, are well positioned to undo, if they've done harm, to undo some of that harm and start to do good, um, but also I think you know with Judith and uh, transition to accelerate the good as much as uh, as a stop. So I'm interested. I know that's a heavy and deep question, but I think to me that's where we all end up when we get when we start these conversations. I guess I'll just keep keep the sequence going, but um, I was maybe uh, looking to defer. But um, uh, Jesse, I think in many ways that is the the key core question. And I, we can point everything back to that history. And we also know, and as I said in the very beginning, um, as, a, as the nation's largest fund of the arts and humanities, we know how our wealth was accumulated uh, and it was accumulated uh, at, at the expense of others. And we know that. And I think the, the uh, on top of that, the, the, our, the history of our funding, which is only 50 years old, but it still uh, had been in a certain way, had really been to reinforce historic legacy white institutions, uh, in particular in major cities. Um, that really did redress only certain communities. And, and so we have been taking this course, um, I think over the last decade, but particularly under the leadership of our current president, Elizabeth Alexander, to uh, understand what our role is in tell telling what we call truer American, the truer American story. And what is uh, our role? And for me, the the, the movement of funding from one place to another does not address what you're saying. I think it, it is not, not enough to do that. I think that is one step, but the second step really is about creating the systems that should have been created all along. Um, one of the other things I'll just mention is that we recently supported the establishment of, a, of an artist employment initiative called Creators Rebuild New York. That was specifically a New York state uh, initiative that looks to, um, uh, try to address uh, through modeling the things that I've been talking about regarding the valuing of the artist. And uh, it's a two-pronged program. One is uh, a guaranteed income program. As we know, uh, through the pandemic, a lot of uh, guaranteed income experiments have, have arisen, especially in, in America, across the country. And we are experimenting with one of our own that can actually provide a stable income for um, 2,400 artists in New York State. And we're balancing that with uh, another, with an artist employment program that looks at the reality that in many cases, um, smaller arts institutions across the state, the, one of the first things they actually ended up doing was actually had to let go and lay off artists to work with them. And what do we, how do we actually engage, especially for organizations that are in rural parts of the state outside of big cities um, in um, uh, uh, acknowledging that they are the ones who, who know best what artists need and where they are and are there ways for us to actually start to model 
different relationships of employment between institutions and artists? And can we start to model those examples? So um, I think for us, the, the real change of looking at the systems change that Angelique mentioned is the best way for us to address issues of colonialism and, and the colonialist past. I think when we're thinking about um, systems, and I think Jesse, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, it's it's hard to go back, right? We we can't go back to pre-colonial times. Um, I think what's really important though is that we think about notions of governance. Um, you know, the Inter-American Development Bank works specifically to support governments to make good policy decisions. And I think Emil just mentioned several policy decisions that are very easy to integrate into state government budgets or at a federal level. Um, and I think it's so important to recognize that when policymaking happens, there's often a little bit of an arrogance that you have to have. You are actually taking pen to paper and designing the future, which I think is also, you know, when we think about mindsets and worldviews, that's, that's a, a weighty responsibility. It's a sacred responsibility in a lot of ways, how you design this future. And I think that's why it's so vitally important to ensure that there are diverse and culturally diverse voices in those spaces for those conversations. So some of the things that I've been really proud about in Panama, we're doing a lot of work with indigenous and Afro-descendant peoples, specifically on designing action plans and strategies to look and move forward and think about what does inclusive recovery and inclusive uh, job job making look like in these communities and in these spaces. And I see myself personally as an international public servant. I'm here for the service of others. And if we have more people in international organization spaces and, and governments that see themselves as public servants, it's actually very compatible with these notions of collective responsibility of ensuring and lifting up all voices. And I feel like between action plans, but between ensuring that voices and policies are targeting specific populations, I mean, we've seen a real revolution in Latin America and the Caribbean with levels of acceptance and interest in cultural diversity. Because again, governments are beginning to understand more and more that that cultural diversity is is their is their benefit. It's their it's it's their resilience. It's what makes them what they are. It's what they have to incorporate in science and technology. It's what they have to incorporate in the tourism sector. It's what they have to incorporate in any aspect of innovation you could possibly think of. Because when someone is thinking about Bolivia, the cultural expressions that they're seeing are indigenous cultural expressions. These are the things that people are associating with the countries of Latin America and of the Americas as a whole. And when we lose sight of that, we get ourselves in a situation where we don't know who we are as Americans and we're not competitive, whether that's economically competitive, whether that's competitive in terms of social programs and quality of life. I mean, I love the discussions that have been going on for many years now in Latin America around the notion of buen vivir. So you look at notions of how do you live well? Um, there are exam international examples also that look at this. So when we're looking at policy and we're creating policy measures that take into account this notion of a good life, what a good life looks like and what a good life looks like for all of the members of society, we can come up with models that are just extraordinarily and extraordinary and exceptional and models that include some of that traditional knowledge and wisdom of the Americas. Jesse, can I just jump in? Um, and I will firstly just wanna say hallelujah, what you just said. Yeah. And also, also just, um, uh, I also want to just talk a bit more about that responsibility question, because I think that again is from, a, from our standpoint in philanthropy, uh, the question of responsibility and risk go hand in hand. And I think for us to actually truly address issues of equity and also address the history of colonialism, we can't expect those that have been marginalized to be the ones to carry that burden. And so, the question for us really isn't about just handing funding, it's really about shouldering risk and shouldering responsibility. And so as, as whether it's governments or it's, it's funders, what are we doing to actually remove the risk of failure, the risk of, uh, of, of, um, of not succeeding from, from those and actually carrying it for them? I think traditionally we have all um, uh, sort of used very, very, very similar um, measures of risk assessment. And, you know, look at risk mitigation as, as, as a term that we think is a good thing. And also we, we actually think of risk in a way that's sort of negative. 
for me, for us at, at Mellon, we're trying to reimagine how we actually celebrate risk because for us, the more risk we take, the more we should celebrate that we're doing the right thing because that we're actually helping remove the burden of risk from others and actually carrying it ourselves. So I think there is a, there is a reality to um, not just um, the, the shouldering of work, but the shouldering of risk. Oh, there's your mic drop moment, uh, Emil. Good hallelujah to, to those sentiments. I hope, I hope every cultural funder heard that because I think that's really important that they have the ability to shoulder the risk that uh, and they should take the risk and that that's that's part of what they're there to do. We could go on and on, but I fear that we we will dominate the, the summit. We are at this incredible cultural summit that's going on. What what would you encourage people to think about and discuss over these these days? Um, what what do you hope they what we hope we all take from this this moment when we're gathering and having these incredibly important conversations. Uh, let's start with Judith this time. Excellent. Well, I think the Americas is cultural diversity. Everything about the Americas, whether it's biodiversity, cultural diversity, I mean, this is the formation and the bedrock of what the Americas are. So the first thing I would say is to be creative and to think about how this notion of cultural diversity really can impact all sorts of ways that we move forward. I mean, that's one thing listening to both Esther and Angelique, when we understand that really who we are and this cultural component of the, of the Americas, that will enable us to harness all sorts of types of development, all sorts of types of progress, and perhaps most importantly, notions of equity. To make sure that the hemisphere is positioned to be one of the most equitable places in the world. And unfortunately, we can't say that now, but hopefully with some of the discussions and the deliberations that are gonna be happening over the next couple of days, there will be some solutions around innovation that take, an, take advantage and learn from the resilience of the Americas and those of us who inhabit the Americas. So, um, you know, it's a tremendous opportunity and it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you to have this rich discussion about next steps and ways that culture are so important to all of us. Um, I guess uh, I'll echo everything Judith just said and just talk, just amplify the, the, the point about cultural diversity. I think I would, um, my recommendation, I guess, and this is how perhaps I would just, uh, I will traverse the, the summit myself, is um, in the understanding that the solutions to one's own challenges actually don't only come from yourself. They don't only come from within. How do, do we actually show up um, with a, with a, a bit of both transparency, humility, vulnerability, both um, as, a, as an individual, but also in represent, representing any kind of entity or institution or even community to be able to learn from uh, how others do. And I think in particular, we in America have been very guilty of, uh, of thinking that we, knew, we know best. And so it's really important, I think for us, for, for all of us to actually look elsewhere for answers and for solutions, for ideas, and to come at this with humility. Um, I think that's the the best way we can all appreciate, uh, I guess, uh, um, value what, what will happen this week. And I think that becomes the um, uh, a lesson that we can all learn from, I'm um, hoping um, over, the, over the coming weeks and years. Again, thank you both so much for this enlightening and really vital uh, conversation. I really appreciate spending this time with uh, both of you. So I'd like to thank both uh, Judith Morrison and Emil Kang. I also wanna thank Angelique Power and Esther Hernandez for their fabulous contributions and the organizers for uh, having us. I wish you all having a, a great rest of the conference and I'll say uh, miigwetch, 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 uh, chi miigwetch uh, for listening to us here today. Es un placer poder participar en la Cumbre Cultural de las Américas 2021. El potencial de la música para unir y humanizar es infinito. Por eso, los temas generales de la conferencia realmente resuenan con nosotros. Mi nombre es Danilo Pérez y soy pianista, compositor, educador, artista por la paz de la UNESCO y el embajador cultural de la República de Panamá. And my name is Kurt Elling. 
and I'm a singer and composer from Chicago. Danilo and I are delighted to have the chance to speak with you and to offer up a small performance. The themes of the conference are close to our hearts and we wish to encourage you in the work you're doing. Esta es nuestra primera coproducción y Kerr y yo compartimos preocupaciones parecidas respecto a temas de la política, de la inmigración, el racismo y el aislamiento. La idea fue crear un panorama musical con letra y música que abarcara estos temas. Gratitude to International Federation of Arts Councils and Culture Agencies, IFACA, and the National Endowment for the Arts for this invitation. And now a small and mysterious musical offering for you. This was recorded as my brother Danilo and I were working on our duo project, an album called Secrets Are the Best Stories, which we are grateful to say won a Grammy Award last year in the United States and an Edison Award in Holland. This piece dances around the question, what is it like? As in, what is it like to be here now? to be alive, and to have the enigmatic gift of our time. We hope you enjoy it. Starring in a play Acting out some destiny Far, far away From anywhere Like watching yourself Walk down the street Like what's new Tossing your hair Like watching people watching you Like hanging out in no town Like you knew the lingo Like flying kites from a basement window like checking it out saying to yourself yes okay yes like being someone like going somewhere Astral weeks for months on end, and always blue, mean old daddy. And do the way young lovers do, like finding the moon and painting it white. Like a bridal gown Like being with someone 
like we were going somewhere. Like a Chelsea morning, like a tender berry. Oh, darling. Like I was never there. Thank you, Danilo and Kurt, for that beautiful performance. Que lindo fue. A perfect way to end the first day of the 2021 America's Cultural Summit. Thank you for spending your evening with us. I certainly found it to be energizing and thought-provoking. Yes, Guillemar, and hope you're enjoying the art bursts interspersed throughout the America's Cultural Summit. I do want to give credit where credit is due. The concept and term art burst was borrowed from our friends at the National Performance Network and their annual conference. Always important to have artistry flowing through any type of convening, whether in person, or virtual. Absolutely, Mike. And don't forget, we have three days left in the conference and your participation is key. So please plan on joining us tomorrow morning. Yes, thanks, Guillemar. And on behalf of the National Endowment for the Arts and our friends at Ithaca, we truly appreciate you being here. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening, depending on where you're resuming in from. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning for day two of the conference. See you soon. Nos vemos mañana, amigos.